because I want to get one to do well on that stuff. We're not going on that right now. Are we good? Yes. So please get that in. So we'll talk about the Declaration of Independence in just one second. And once again, you know, we just got to be ready. So it seems like most people got PDFs and it worked pretty well. If we have to go, we have to go. You know, they just, uh, the National Guard has been sent to our hospital to help because it's so old. It's, it's so overcrowded. And their bodies stacked up in, in the hallways. We just have to be ready. I hope not, but we have to be ready. It's much worse than last year. Right now. It's almost all unvaccinated people. It's kind of scary. But there's sort of some vaccinated. About one out of five vaccinated people can get it, even though the symptoms aren't as bad. It's not even close. So we just have to be ready. Once again, that's my warning. And on that happy note, let's get to the Declaration of Independence. I hope not. All thing I'm worried about is just like literally overnight, also, we'll be told not to come. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what worries me. So as long as we have teams set up, and my guess is we'll just have to do our best for a couple weeks. We'll meet in class time. I'll do, we'll do it online. We did a lot, Julie. We can do this. We can do it. I know, you're almost overwhelmed with excitement. So back. So what city did the British evacuate? Baxton. Why? Because where did they get the cannon from? Or, and Ticonderoga would make a what? A great name. A great name. Little Ticonderoga. And who is the hero of Ticonderoga who later on would have a different reputation? Benedict Arnold. Yeah, Benedict Arnold. Uh, the king, they, had, they sent the Olive Branch petition, the first Continental Congress. The king responded with telling everybody that they're traitors and what would happen to them? <laughs> that we'd be disemboweled. Let's talk about that again. No, so, no. <laughs> by the way, I did the thing in the fourth period. I'm just thinking, you guys get to go to lunch. Okay, so with that, that's not bad. Thanks. Not a bad picture. What was the big bloody battle the British won that had horrible casualties? The Bunker Hill. Hill. Yeah, Bunker Breeze. Hill, even though it happened on Breeze Hill. All right, so we got the events leading up to Independence. Oh, what did Lord Dunbar, Den, Dunmore do in Virginia? That was kind of the last straw. There were pretty many southern colonies, especially. Yes. Yeah, if they fight, they, they're free. And this goes completely against, well, that entire economic system of the South. And you can imagine thousands of slaves took the, the chance to go to freedom. And don't forget, and I'll mention this again, that fear of slave rebellion was overriding. People forget about that. It's one thing they kind of try to hide. The slave rebellions are the most horrific thing you can imagine. Yeah, maybe not the most horrific, but right up there, along with this involvement. So with that, so let's go ahead and get to this. We, um, we got, re we get independence. We got, we want to just do it, land. Lord Dunmore. So let's get to Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine at the same time, he was an Englishman, he came to the colonies and he wrote this amazing pamphlet called Common Sense. This is the time of a pamphleteer. They would write these out, they print them real fast. And Paine wrote this as um, basically this idea was pushing the colonists to demand independence. Well, demanding independence means demanding them to rebel. And he was a child of the Enlightenment, we'll get to the Enlightenment more in just a second. There's Thomas Paine, got the same picture right there. And Paine was quite the radical. He believed in equality for all men and to some degree, women, eventually all men and women, all humans are equal. He also believed and was fearful of the vast difference between the classes and wanted more, they literally called it leveling, to level the difference between the classes. He was quite the radical, came to, at the time, He'd be considered very radical today. Yes. So when he stated that all men are created equal, does he also include like is this at the time where like he thought that the slaves would be equal? Yeah, he, he, he despised slavery. But all men, all men have. And at the time he wrote this, it was men and women should have more rights. Eventually, by 
Within 10 years, he's thinking all men and women. He had great influence because he wrote so clearly in a way that people like and enjoy. Just had that knack for the time. You know, today wouldn't be quite as, as easy to read, but back then, people loved it. And he also said, the best form of government is a republic. A government by representatives, and one of the more radical things he believed is the, re the representatives should be chosen by people, aka the vote. Not just a few tiny elite, which is the way parliament was, or the most legislative bodies in the colonies. So, a republic. And he despised monarchy, because what? Why is there a king? Divine right was the reason that European kings, including King George III, gave themselves for power. Divine right means the king gets their power from what or whom? Yes. God. God has endowed them. And so sometimes it might even go to the point where they are like a god. Like the Tsar of Russia would be a godlike figure. King George III said, I'm a human, but God has given me this power through my family connections. So basically, it's luck of birth. They just happen to be born, and now we're stuck with them as a king. By the way, you could get a lunatic. King George would eventually become poor King George. And they're king because they just happen to be born a king. Nothing they did, nothing they accomplished. And that's where he was really worried about the people inheriting wealth and power and position. They somehow are going to be put ahead of everybody else, and the vast majority of people are going to be left behind. And as generations go on, they will be even further behind. Aristotle's what he hated. So he said, why should we follow the king? There's no reason we can't govern ourselves. This made sense to people angry at the king. You know, they wanted their land. They wanted their rights. They wanted to decide their own fate. And so he also talked about we're going to have to have some kind of egalitarian. Egalitarian is what I mentioned before, that kind of leveling of the classes. The idea that there should not be such a vast gulf between the upper and lower classes. It exists today. This huge difference. And he had great influence. That's why in the United States, when the country was first created, they tried to do everything they can to get rid of inherited wealth. So, for example, there's no titles of nobility in the United States. That is against the Constitution. And does anybody know what primogenitor is? It was a European medieval law for feudalism where the inheritance, like the land and the title, always goes to the first son. Always, automatically. And so that the, the family maintains their power. That is illegal. That is unconstitutional in the U.S. I mean, they can, in their, they could write a will and say it goes to the person, but it's not automatic. So the idea is that there is inherent wealth, but the thought was everybody should have a clean slate when they're born. Now, that does not happen, but that was the idea of the founding fathers. And so let's get back to this thing, Thomas Paine. And so we already had, we had this, right? So we have this, we have this, do we get to this? So they're starting to debate the declaration. To, they're starting to debate independence in Independence Hall. Well, now we call it Independence Hall. It'd be called this right after they, the, uh, they declared it. But they had to write a document and they need to, this document would have to justify, but also to appeal to allies specifically, what country did the United States desperately want to join in and help them? Yeah. France. France. And they knew France was mad at Britain. The irony is France had an autocratic monarch with full control of their state. And we were appealing to them to help create a republic, which is kind of the complete opposite. But you know what? Enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. And that's what we wanted. That we knew that. So we had to make something to say, we mean business. We're not just declaring independence because, you know, we're mad today. And tomorrow we'll go back. We mean it. We're in it to win independence, and therefore you can trust us, join us. And so they picked five people to draft a document to do this. So don't forget, this document was a political statement. It's politics. Everything's politics, but it's politics. Now the five men 
would be some of the most famous patriots, four incredibly famous ones, and then another guy who was not quite as famous. He would become very famous. John Adams, the lawyer, we've talked about him before. Massachusetts, he wanted Washington. Next, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was already one of the most famous men in the United States. No for Fort Richard Almanac, uh, Child of the Enlightenment. He's going to become the most famous man in the world by the end of the war, which is pretty amazing for someone who started in the, in the colonies. And then two more that are not as well known. Robert Livingston of New York would be famous for uh, patriotic writing, especially against the Townshend Act. And then Roger Sherman. And Sherman's one incredibly important for the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But since he didn't really hold a major high office afterwards, he's kind of forgotten. And then at Adam's suggestion, he suggested Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was this young, uh, uh, Plantation owner inherited an incredible amount of wealth. So the old, you know, he earned his money the old-fashioned way. He inherited it. Kept over almost 200 slaves, but he was also a well-known philosopher. Uh, what they would start calling at this time a Renaissance man. He invented, he did all sorts of things. Pretty amazing guy. And I would argue both really good and really bad. So kind of a good indicator of uh, what's coming up. He wrote the Declaration of Religious Freedom for the Colony of Virginia, the Virginia Declaration of Religious Freedom. And this so impressed Adams that he suggested it. And he suggested it. He had not really spoken. He didn't go to the First Continental Congress. He was kind of shy, awkward, didn't like speaking in public. So it's kind of a surprise. But Adams was persuasive and he's chosen. Now, here's the thing. Here's the five men and one of those lithographs from the 1850s. They didn't sit around and write this together. In fact, these four were well known. They wanted to sit in the taverns and eat and debate and argue independence and keep uh, key uh, uh, events going on, debate on the floor of the Congress. They didn't want to be stuck in a dark room by candlelight writing this document. So Adams and Franklin went to Jefferson, relatively young, and they went to him and they said, you know, Thomas, you're the smartest of us all. You are so much smarter. You write better than us. We can't put into words what you already know, what you've done. You should write this. And what did Jefferson do? He's like, you're right, I am the smartest. How did you know? So Jefferson sat in this little tiny room. It's about maybe four, uh, four or five blocks, big blocks in Philadelphia from Independence Hall. By candlelight, writing it. Well, they went to the taverns and debated and argued. I think that's kind of funny, but it worked, and they chose right. Jefferson had read all these philosophers. He took what they said and compiled it into something brilliant. No, he did not come up with this on his own. But the brilliance was how he was able to consolidate this. I mean, look at this. The meat of the Declaration of Independence is this paragraph. He says so much here, it's kind of startling. And when people around the world look at the United States and say, what's to admire to the United States, about the United States? And what makes the United States something to emulate? It's what's in here. One paragraph, that of McDonald's, right? No, except in Yum, there's no McDonald's in Yum. You already forgot you got rid of McDonald's in Yum, and that was your joke. Oh. Where do you want the dinner? Never got. Never got. Wouldn't that hurt? Can you imagine? I know someone did that. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no, but it's Wisconsin. No, call it. I don't know where it's from. Malta was the place we got this. I paper cut my nose once. Licking Manila envelope. Woo! That was something. Moving on. Let me tell you about that one before lunch. All right, so Jefferson wrote this, and here's the thing. He had, some people have criticized him and said he copied the idea. No, he didn't. You know, why reinvent the wheel every time you draw? He took it and made it something that was actually usable. It wasn't abstract philosophy. 
It was for the creation of the state. And one more thing about this document, and write this down right here. The Declaration of Independence is not law. This is the founding philosophy of the United States. It's not law. What's the law of the land? Which would be written a decade later, which is dry and pretty boring except for the preamble. This is not law, this is our founding principles. And applying to Jefferson's point of view, as long as you stick to the founding principles, you can change the Constitution. The Constitution is not widely admired around the world. The Declaration of Independence is. What's admired about the Constitution is we actually wrote it down. What's in it, uh, they, 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 most people avoid that. There's a lot, there's some flaws there, basically. So that's one of the rough drafts. There's all these rough drafts. That's Jefferson's writing. And I love how he capitalized that. And they're all in the Library of Congress. And so they have all these drafts. And then you see where they crossed out and they put in different words. And Franklin and Adams and Sherman and Livingston, they all wrote things in, the little carrot and wrote it. And so they're writing this while they're debating on the floor of the United States, or of the uh, Independence Hall. They're debating independence. Little tiny room, they're all packed in. And I just like this. If you go to the uh, Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., they have a, a kind of a, a permanent display of all the drafts. It's really cool. And here it is. That's what it looked like. That's what it looked like in October of 2019. That's when I was there and took that picture. And I was surrounded by uh, fourth graders. I went in, my wife and I went in line, and all of a sudden they had a class of fourth graders from some school outside of Philadelphia, and they were taking their field trip to Independence Hall. And there were still kids all over the place. And have you been around 30 fourth graders? It's terrifying. The only thing worse is like third, second, or first, because they just keep getting smaller. So they're out of my vision, and they just come at you. And there was one kid, his name was Jeremy. And as you remember, the teacher behind, Jeremy, 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 where's Jeremy? Jeremy? I like Jeremy. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know what? Why not? And the chair here, hard to see because you can't use black in there. So I couldn't. But it's really small. And that's all the table. That's all the table. So I'm saying I'm literally at a little game up in the kitchen. But they were all packed in there. It must have been pretty hot that summer. And this chair right here, there's a sun. Look at either the sun is rising or the sun is setting. And that was always a metaphor. Are we going to be the rising sun or the setting sun? I think that's a pretty good one. Franklin would famously say that when they wrote the Constitution in the same room. So with that, independence. So they finally decided after a month of debate going into July, independence is inevitable. And so everyone there is pretty much a full-fledged patriot and reconciliation is gone because we're all going to be disemboweled anyway. So with that, Richard Henry Lee would make a resolution, basically a law, a resolution of independence. Everyone calls it Lee's resolution. And yes, he is direct, he's a direct relation to Robert E. Lee, who, are, this irony, that in the Lee family, you have the person who uh, had the resolution to make the United States, and one of his most famous traitors, also in the same family. The United States is a great place, and we're very unique. But, the past, it would pass 12, there'd be one abstention. Go down a little bit. They also be the last one to do the Constitution. Out of the first couple votes, it was seven to one against, and five states said, ah, we're going to wait and see. Let's give you an idea how controversial it was. Then eight to three to one was the next vote, and finally, on this, they finally got 12 to one, and they figured, close enough. Thus, Independence Day, a day John Adams said would be celebrated for all eternity. July 2nd, 1776. And when word came out, it got to New York very quickly. New York was under the threat of British invasion. We'll come back to that. They immediately toppled the statue of George III. If states make statues for very important reasons, almost always to show who's in charge. We're in charge. Here's our king. 
You can't make a statue. We do. Wherever the Romans were going, it's like, you know, the feeling is incredible building, but one of them was always a statue of the current emperor. Because usually Augustus, because he had all these statues of Augustus, and even after he was dead, they just would chop his head off and put the other on Augustus' body. So if you see Roman statues, it's almost always the same guy doing this, the same fake body of Augustus. You don't make him look in you know, with a different head off. So it's that. And then there's the actual in the paper, I love it, John Hancock. This by order of Congress. <laughs> I can't help it. Every time I see it, it makes me laugh. But you probably heard of the Liberty Bell, haven't you? When they read this out, the Liberty Bell, they rang the bell so hard. This is from this little pamphlet from 1976, the bicentennial year. So I can vividly remember 1976, the bicentennial, and we're all told to go ring a bell. I just vividly remember that. It's amazing the little things like that you remember. Ring a bell. You won't be like that too often. You'll be very old like me. But why do I remember something from when I was 30? That was 30 in 1976. That makes me what now? You think not there. Is that 30 or 40? As you notice, I'm to the age where I've forgotten my age, so I just made stuff up. But I was there in 1976. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you it. Not close. 79? 2011. 2011. Yeah. And this is not my hair. It's, it's a two page. Moving <laughs> <like that. Who laughs> on. The start with it rang the bell so hard. What happened to the bell? It cracked. Is that true? Of course not. The bell cracked in in um, what uh, in a problem with forging the bell. It was pretty common with bells to crack there. And you see the crack right here. People wait in line hours. Like I did over an hour to have a picture of me standing by the bell. Like, You're not seeing that picture. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much. You can almost hear me say it. They might have rung the bell. But this became a great tourist trap, just like from the block. And you would not believe how many people pay 20 bucks to go stand by the bell, including yours truly. <laughs> and it's all made up, but it, you know, that's been this dramatic story. I gotta be honest with you though, I still wanted to see it. So that's the picture I took. And this is what we call a zombie myth. Why do we call it the zombie myth? Because they don't die. And this is from the classic movie, Flat Nine from Outer Space, which is considered universally the worst movie ever made. <laughs> and if you continue to mistreat me, I'll make you watch it. Actually, it's so bad, it's wonderful. So we, in special topics, I always start the semester with a unit on 50s horror movies, because they're all Cold War. It's such a, you know, good historical stuff, but also get a chance to watch a classic old horror movie they all love. And then I'll usually show this one, it's really short and it's so bad, and you just laugh the whole time at how bad the movie is. That's actually a really fun unit. So, the Declaration of Independence. And here's the thing they declared independence and everybody went home. Except for Hancock. The document, though, was still being written by scribes. So, by hand, they're trying to write this thing out. In fact, they wrote it out so fast. That when Hancock, who was the only one left, he was what we would call the president of the Congress. Don't think in the terms of the Constitution. The president is the one who beat the gavel to start the meeting. That's all the president did. He was the last one there. So there's all this room on the bottom, so he signed it really big. Now, later on, he would say, if I'm signing my death warrant, I want them to read my name. Good story. They're all committing treason by signing this. But no one even thought about others signing it. He just signed it because the document's there and they're going to send it out to show him. Mean, this was not considered that big of a deal. But it was two days later. In fact, they were in such a hurry that you see one of those little carrots and they had to write in the word only. So they forgot a word. But Hancock had already signed it. And so that is the original Declaration of Independence. If you go to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., that document is there. And you can wait in line and look at it very quickly. 
When I was there the last time, they had the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and Lincoln's handwritten Emancipation Proclamation. The third one is usually a rotation. They rotate. And then every night it goes down to a bombshell. And it's supposed to withstand about a 10 kiloton nuclear weapon, which means it's not enough to withstand the weapons that would have been used, but they try to put it in there to save it. Now, here's the thing. Has anyone seen it? It's not the real declaration. That's a lot. Oh. <laughs> How do I know? There was this guy on the street selling when I walked out. He told me this is a real thing. He looked honest. And it came with the original 1776 lamination. So we know it's the real thing. And it came up really small. We could have laminated this better. And, and it has a piece of tape on it because I ripped it. I ripped the original, but it's mine. <laughs> so you are in for a treat, right? So I will pass this around. It's, it's, it's kind of, oh, the, the, that was a hole from the fighting in the Civil War. <laughs> so with that, I'll pass this around as we talk about this, but you can look at it and see John Hancock. The other signatures are done in September and October. Everything went to hell fast. And they were losing. It looked like it's over. And so all of them said, we better make sure we mean business. So they signed it after the fact to show that they meant it. This was a kind of a loyalty over. Are you really serious? You gotta sign it. And there are a few people like, I don't know. What's winner? Maybe they misspelled their, their words with some British style. So I'll pass it around. And last thing about this here. Everyone write down the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence. See that document right up there though? That is written was done by a handbill. It's called a handbill, so just one piece of paper. Done with a printing press, as, and they got this out as quickly as possible after it was written. And this copy right here, and you notice it's only signed by John Hancock, because the other signatories had not signed it yet, the other members of the Congress. And they sent this all over the colonies to, much to the surprise of the other colonies, you're now in a new country called the United States. What? We are? And this document is how they found out, which is quite a shock. And so they didn't really find out, or it wasn't as important when they declared independence as when they read this handbook they put up on doors or in like in the city square on either that kind of bulletin board or on a tree. And do you notice what it says on the top? In Congress, July 4. And so that, because of this document, people associated with that's independence. And really, by the end of the Revolutionary War, people were having little. Obviously, a lot different than the celebrations today, which are basically you always have a sale on stuff. But you know, little celebrations, they would acknowledge it by the end of the war. And by 1800, this was independence. Does the day really matter? A little bit, but the reality of it, it does. And July 4th is so. 1776 in Philadelphia, July whatever, that's when the United States was created. No, we're not sure what the United States is yet, but it's created. And let's talk about the philosophy. And so with that, we got to look at the Declaration of Independence. Oh, we must get to something else. The Enlightenment. Because these are children of the Enlightenment. When we talk about the philosophy of the Declaration of Independence, we have to talk about the Enlightenment first. And the Enlightenment is sometimes it's called the Age of Reason. And it really got its start with Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton is not an enlightened figure. He's from the scientific revolution. But Newton, who wrote the Mathematica Principia, who not only created calculus, so if you like calculus, thank you, Isaac. He also, in there, he laid out the mathematical theory of what? Yeah, gravity. Before that, people just flew off into space. But Newton <laughs> put that down. Now, this is one of those things where, yeah, that's pretty amazing. We now have mathematical rules for us, and we turn out about 99.99% of the universe. It works every single time. Now, let's be clear, that 0.001%, crazy. But we, won't, we didn't know about that yet. 
He basically laid out a mathematical, uh, mathematical formula for us. And this is just blue people's minds. And yes, he will go to Parliament because of this. And he um, said four words in Parliament, his entire 10 years of Parliament. You know what he said? Please shut the window. That's true. I have to do. <laughs> so, back to Newt. He, this would trigger me in life. Because if you can have mathematical formulas, laws for the universe, which turn out to be shockingly accurate, it blew people away. You know, there's not a big magnet in the middle of the world kind of holding us in as we walk around. That just blew people away. So, if it'd be natural uh, laws, natural laws for the universe, can't we have natural laws for society? And if we have natural laws for society, that means that we, we have the power to shape these laws. That's a big shift. If there's natural laws for the, for the universe, that means there's natural laws to govern society. And that's where you start getting philosophers starting with that guy right there, who would begin to try to come up with these laws for why governments happen, why we allow tyranny, how to get rid of tyranny. We can make this into a world based upon reason. Now that's always a trend, this might shock you, but people don't always act reasonable. We tend to be human, but that was their goal. And thus, Something that was started in the Renaissance, actually before the Renaissance, I have 13, 14 years this concept of humanism. This concept of humanism is we have been put on this world with really big brains to make decisions for ourselves. Therefore, people are, you know what sovereign means? It's a great word. Yeah. Allow the government themselves to other people. Exactly. So we, you know what an easy way to say that is? Because you're exactly right. It's power. Yeah. People have power. Sovereignty means power. So ultimately, we have power over ourselves. Yeah, sure. We fought, you know, people tell us what to do. We decided to do it or not. But we are ultimately powerful. That means we as individuals are powerful. That means society, we, are power, we have the power to decide who leads us and who doesn't. We are ultimately powerful. And no one can, no one can necessarily tell us what to do. Write that down. I'm here. Bad joke, I'm sorry. So that leads to a philosophy. It's something about liking your religion, but it's more complex than that. It's going to be called deism. And deism directly comes from Newton to the Enlightenment. By the way, Newton was no deist. He would not have liked this at all. Newton believed his mathematical formulas proved that uh, the, the great Bede's writing that the Earth was about 4,400 years old. Because that's what he, so he was, he was not a deist. But anyways, they looked at it as if the entire universe is governed by mathematical formulas, that means the creator is like a great mathematician or a great technician. And what is the most technical produced product in the world at that time? A clock, a hand, a small portable clock, an accurate clock was beyond the skills of most of human time. It was just beginning to be built in the 1700s. And so the idea was like God, or the creators like the clock made, and made this beautiful creation, all governed by mathematical formulas. So it's making this, and basically there's nothing. There's nothing. Start, just nothing. And the creator constructed all of this, and then looked back on their work, and decided, good. And and like my sound effects for the universe working pretty good, huh? And then what did the creator do? Get back and watch their creation. That was little sprinkling jerks. No, I'm jerks. Yeah, just some sprinkling. He did that accurate before he spoke the switch. When I saw that, I first, I first thought it said jeans, and I was like, oh wow. <laughs> but it said jerks, and I was really happy. Very good. And so who's responsible? There's not any interacting God according to deism. 
So with that, almost all the founding fathers were deists. And by definition, they're not Christians. Is Christian, Christianity required in the interaction? Now, they, they split the difference. You know, like George Washington, uh, like almost everybody, uh, every wealthy Virginia was an Episcopal Church of England. And yet he never used the word God. Never. He wrote creator. He was a deist. Jefferson was a deist. Now, what does that mean? That's their view of the world. But do you see how this could justify revolution? We are powerful. And so, John Locke, who would write back in the last century, is arguably the first of these philosophers of this new enlightenment. And there's going to be a huge reaction against the enlightenment. And then what they're saying is, we all have certain rights that we were born with, a.k.a. liberty, thus the term liberalism, which comes from this concept of liberty. Now, if I use the term liberal today or conservative today, people misuse it so often that the, name, the words are almost meaningless. They're almost like weird teams. So we'll have to get to the basics of it, because liberalism has all kinds of different meanings. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. let's bring it up to the end before I ask about it. Yep. Thank you. Got it. Yeah. By the way, he could have been an assassin. You didn't know him. Yeah, we have not got. You not got over this yet? No, we haven't got over this. Oh. Yes, he was in my class a few years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You bet. That could have been an assassin. Yes, he was my student. He said, uh, yeah. "I've been here a very." Hey, remember what I told you, 1970, or 1976, I was 40 years old. Just not. So, everyone's out to get it, correct? Yes. I'm not paranoid, but there's a massive school-wide plot against you, so you could have been in the past. It's fine. So you have to alert me of this. If someone comes in the room, you have to yell, what? Experiment. Let's say I'm a stranger. Practice. <laughs> so, you all, I come in. I'm weak. I can have a knife in my back. <laughs> and if it's an administrator or someone, what do we do? The yeah, assassin then hide under our desk. <laughs> right? We'll work on this. We'll talk about this. But. Your you guys have a big responsibility. Who wants to do a math test? What math is this? Where were we? Oh, back to liberalism. This is the father of liberalism. And I, I should, uh, when I say liberal and conservative are misused all the time. The term liberal in Europe means something significantly different than what the term liberal means in the United States, just for example. So it's it's really all over the place. And it really just down, it comes down to what you really believe, and that's where it gets complex. So what he said is natural rights. All of us have rights. Are they natural? Yes. They were given to us by the creator. Gee, I wonder if the Declaration of Independence says that. And what did he say? We have these basic rights. And you notice how vague they are. This is not law. And what are they? Life, liberty, and he said originally possessions, but that would turn into property. And there is John Locke. And since I have a relatively big nose, I understand I simplify that he also has a very big nose. I'm telling you something. My nose is relatively big, which I blame my father, but you know, a big nose. And clearly, when they drew the pen, he probably even had a bigger nose, and they're trying to make it a little smaller. So with that, let's get in. That is the enlightenment, the deism, this process. Let's start the pen. So we got to read the Declaration of Independence. We'll do it today and tomorrow. That's why I'm giving you until Monday. I gave you the Declaration of Independence. I am looking for a volunteer to read the first part of this. 
And this is the basic element. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Ryan. You're going to do it. And I'm get, I need my declaration. Okay, go. Okay. Oh, we should have good, good eye on that. It was not unanimous. They just rolled it down. Maybe. Very good. And here's the thing about that. What they what what they say before anything else? We have real reasons. This is not trivial. We have real reasons. We mean business. But you also notice the D is in there. Do you catch it? Why? They specify nature. So. Yeah. To the creation of nature. They, Jefferson was very much a deist. The laws of nature, nature is God. Which nature is God? The creation. So, let's get into the main meat of the philosophy. Who would like to read the next part? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Will all these truths be so evident that all men are created equal? Stop. Okay. Very well done. There are three parts. Which, by the way, these three parts would make fantastic choices for the short ideas. That's what we call science. Number one, equality. And this was pretty radical stuff. Equality. All men are created equal. Now, we're not even, to, don't even think rights yet. First off, when Jefferson wrote that, when he meant all men are created equal, who did he mean was equal? White men. White men. Now, that might seem like he's skipping a lot of people, which, oh yeah most of the population of the world. But I should also add, this is incredibly radical stuff. Most people would not have agreed with it. They just would have assumed there are people on top and people on the bottom, and that's natural. So Jefferson was quite radical. And this is something you'll find out about rights, or if you believe that equal rights is a good thing, I'm showing my bias, I do, that progress Sometimes it takes very small steps. Yes, there were people who said everyone should have rights. Thomas Paine was one. We'll get to somebody else in a second. But still, this is a big step. But when John Adams read All Men Are Created Equal, who did he think? White men with property. So whatever that might mean. That's a big difference, isn't it? Adam said, well, sure, all men are pretty equal. Come on. Some are more equal than others. I mean, you're not property. You really don't matter. Yes? And this doesn't apply Speaking of women, no. Oh, that was a gray area. That was a gray area then. Um, women with property in most colonies could vote for representatives. That right's going to be taken away. So you'll notice it's not like this continuous like, growth of life. It's this. Uh, what's going to happen to African Americans who fought so hard for equal rights after the Civil War, all of those will be taken away. We'll get to that. And they have to fight. It's shockingly hard to get that back. But, all men. Now, I mean, today I read this as all humans, but it's still pretty radical stuff. And Abigail Adams. So Abigail Adams was was Adams' wife. Incredibly intelligent. You know, this brilliant person who's married to another brilliant person. Uh, married to kind of a nut job, too. John Adams is kind of crazy. I'll tell you some John Adams stories later. But they, she wrote her husband in the few weeks before this saying, hey, don't forget the ladies. That's literally what she said. Don't ladies deserve equal rights? And so the point is, don't think Jefferson was like so radical no one thought there could be more. No. Abigail Adams wrote her husband, and her husband who greatly respected his wife, but was also like, yeah, for you, but come on. Not all women. I mean, that's crazy talk. 
and he was she was ignored. And that would that would be a common way to shut people up. Yeah, that sounds good, but come on, that's too much. Just calm down. In fact, for women, that's where the whole term hysterical comes from. It's the way you describe it. Calm down. Men are like that. And so, with that, so the point is, other people disagree. And one of the two things, we'll get right to the bell ring. There are two ways they looked at it. Equality under the law. Everybody, regardless of their birth, should be equal under the law. So Englishmen don't get unfair laws. Remember the intolerable acts where they could go back to England and be tried there. But also, if you're wealthy, you could maybe buy your way out. Now, this is the goal of the Constitution. Or, I'm sorry, the Declaration of Independence. Has this happened? Jeez. You know how much lawyers cost. You know how it's much different for people who can't afford that. And one more, equality of opportunity. That's what the whole thing about no private janitor, remember I told you that? Here's the problem with that. Equality of opportunity. Can you define what equality of opportunity means? Yes. Well, I'm sorry, Tom, but could it possibly just be like everyone gets an equal chance to get something? Exactly, like succeed in life, whatever that might be. But that's not possible. But does it happen that way? Jefferson wrote this, and he knew he had what he would consider an unfair advantage. He was born rich. The good example today, look at college costs. How much money you have, great, in, when you're 18, greatly affects your opportunity. So, do you see some parts that define parts? And on that happy note, okay, enjoy your lunch. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, oh, the Declaration of Independence. I gave you that copy. I need it back. I only made a classroom set. Oh, I'll print some more pieces. Well, I told him that turn in. You don't get to keep the original. That was why I love eating pork and. When he's an upward. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Why does it stop the demons? Oh, this sucks to me. Very good. I can read it now. Yep, I read it. Very good. Sorry. But you know what? You could argue that demons would work too. But when I first saw stop the demons. Real quick, yeah, it's the button. I had to turn it off, that rises up, and you know, you know the routine, yes. Quit recording. <laughs>